<laughs> Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Griffin's Nest. This is Miss Mithril turning back in here to play with you today. And also, my friend Maelstrom is here. He sees what I've got here. <laughs> Do you know what we're talking about today? Yes, we've been talking about animals this week. All sorts of animals. Today's episode is going to focus on animals that we have in our home. Do you have any animals in your home that you take care of and live with? <laughs> wow, okay. Some people have animals, some people do not. But what's most important is that we treat them like family. And don't tease them like apparently I'm doing right now. <laughs> Poor Maelstrom. Come here, buddy. Come here. Maelstrom. Hey. So what I got right for him right here are special treats. Maelstrom. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Up, up, up. And he knows that when I snap my fingers, that means I want him to come to me. Come to my lap. We can't use our words a lot to talk with our animals. Sometimes we can. Sometimes they learn certain words, and they also listen to the tone in our voice. This is why it's always important to n mean what you say and say what you mean when it comes to our animal friends. <laughs> and always be kind to them. Now, as you can see, he really likes to brush his teeth. These treats are made especially with ingredients to help keep his teeth clean and healthy. I like giving him a couple after his breakfast. <laughs> and I also get extra kisses, as you can see. So, <clears throat> they're, the interesting thing about having an animal is they each have a different breed. Their species is what's called, like, what they are. Maelstrom is a cat. That's his species. But his breed is what you call a gray tabby. Do you know the breed of your animals at home? If you don't, it's always easy to look it up. You can tell by looking at pictures uh, on the internet that might give you an idea of, that look like just like your animal. Or you can ask mommy and daddy to help you. Or you can look in your local zoo books or magazines. Or your fun animal fact books. They always are filled with fun facts and information about your animals. So Maelstrom was what you call a street rescue. You want to get down, buddy? All right, thanks a lot for coming. Still likes those treats. So he, when he was an itty bitty little kitten, I was walking back to my car on my way to home from my job. I was working at a different school that I'm working at now, and <laughs> nobody, no more. <clears throat> and I hear this little mewing sound. And I say to myself, okay, I know that there were kittens with their mommy on the playground, but the rescue people came and got them. Looks like they missed one. And I looked under the car, and there was this hot, scared little gray kitten, and that was Maelstrom. I took him home with the intention on giving him away, finding him a nice home, because I knew he had a dog. And sometimes dogs and cats don't get along together very well, unless you introduce them at a very young age. Well, our dog, Rocky, who his species is a dog, and his breed is a Maltese. That's the type of dog he is. He's a small, white dog. And we thought he wouldn't get along. But when I brought him home, he got along very well with Rocky and the rest of the family. And I had a lot of good friends that decided, we're going to help you keep him. I had friends that offered to pay for his vet visits and gave us supplies and some insight how to take care of him. And to this day, he is a big, <laughs> wide, gray tabby cat that is no longer small and scrawny and hungry. He's well-fed and he's taken care of and he is a good kitty. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about Maelstrom. Um, if you have any animals at home that you would like to share pictures on, ask mommy and daddy if it's okay first, but I would love to see those pictures. Feel free to post them on our page, and uh, I would love to see them. Give a little heart. I bet you got some really cute animals in your home. <laughs> now, as that said,
today we're also going to read a book about a really bold jackrabbit. You know what we didn't do? Oh my goodness, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we did not look at our agenda for today. So right now we're about to do the book. And I'm going to rewrite this at the bottom. Our activity later today is going to be a very simple but very fun one. We're going to play a game of who's missing. I will have five pictures of cute little chihuahuas, which are a type of dog, but a different breed from what, what Rocky is. And I hope you'll be able to join me for that, because it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Alright, so our agenda for today, our schedule. We're going to read our book. Okay, put the marker there. Then we're going to have the animal missing game. And then our folk tale. Alright. I'm going to put it right there. Now, find me. Now let's get started with the Kissing Coyotes book. Kissing Coyotes by Marsha Vaughn, illustrated by Kenneth J. Spencer. So, who wrote the words? Marsha J. Vaughn, that's right. And who drew the pictures? The illustrator, Kenneth J. Spencer. All right, Maelstrom, while I'm up, please don't steal the treats. Oh, goodness. Oh, I really got him going, guys. I gotta hide this. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. All right, let's begin. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear him purring over there. He's trying to ask me for more. All right. Kissing coyotes. For Daniel Brower, the Waka Waka Man, and an instrumental of peace. To Mom and Dad, with much love and gratefulness. Listen up now. It all started down yonder at the watering hole when Jack Rabbit started doing what he did best shooting off his big mouth. Road Runner! said Jack Rabbit, sitting back in his hairy heels. You may think you're graceful, but I'm so gosh darn graceful, I can dance the do-si-do -do with a rattlesnake without getting bit. Is that so? replied Road Runner. That's so. Gilla monster, Jack Rabbit went on. You may think you're frightening as lightning. I'm so all fired fearsome I can scare off a whole herd of longhorn cattle. Easy as saying one, two, three, tie ya yippee. That's a mite hard to believe, Gilla Monster replied. Believe it. In Fox, Jack Rabbit said, you may think you're fast, but I'm so fleet on my feet I can run right inside a skunk's burrow yelling, woo woo, stinky poo, and get away without getting a stunk up. Fox busted out laughing. <laughs> Jack Rabbit, you could talk the tail off a turkey vulture and never tell a lick of truth. You're a gurgling and no guts, Gilla Monster agreed. You'll never do one brave deed in your life, Roadrunner nodded. Oh, that darn Jack Rabbit, so mad. He thumped his feet in the dust. Why, I'm so rootin' tootin' brave I can kiss all the coyotes up on the tabletop rock. Nobody can kiss coyotes and live to tell the tale. I can, declared Jack Rabbit. Prove it, all the animals said. I will, said Jack Rabbit. I'll go kiss those coyotes right now. It didn't take Jack Rabbit more than ten hops to realize what a plum dumb thing he had done. He loped towards Tabletop Rock, hoping there wouldn't be a coyote in sight. Well, shucks. Jack Rabbit couldn't believe his bad luck. Yonder, dozing in the dust, lay a he coyote and a she coyote. And a wee coyote. Before he could change his mind, Jack Rabbit 
called up his courage. On quick, quick feet, he tiptoed timidly up and put a teeny tiny kiss on top of the wee coyote's paw. And guess what? Wee coyote didn't budge. Feeling a mite braver, Jack Rabbit snuck up onto a she coyote and lay a kiss as light as a feather on the tip of her ear. And guess what? She coyote didn't notice at all. Now Jack Rabbit was bustling with boldness. He strode over, puckered up, and planted a big old juicy smoocheroo smack dab on the end of the he coyote's nose. Some mooch. <laughs> and guess what? He coyote didn't twitch a whisker. Hee haw! Jack Rabbit hollered. I kissed all the coyotes. And guess what? <laughs> Whoa! Jackrabbit found himself squeezed tight as to a bark to a tree between two dusty paws. How wow, 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 howled the coyote. I caught a juicy jackrabbit. He's looking plum yummy, said the she coyote. Can I have the first bite? drooled the wee coyote. Looks like he was in over his head, friends. What do you think? Ooh. Do you think that those my coyotes were pretending to be asleep? Coyotes tend to have really good hearing. Maybe they heard the conversation and decided we're going to pretend to be asleep and wait for that coyote, I mean that jackrabbit, to come over and kiss us coyotes. For once in his blabbermouth laugh, Jackrabbit couldn't think of a thing to say. He started quivering and shivering and shaking and quaking. His ears started flip-flapping like branches in the breeze. In no time, they were tickling the tip of his coyote's nose. Oh, chewie! He coyote sneezed, letting his grip slip. Without so much as I beg your pardon, the jackrabbit lit out like lightning. He high-tailed it down the trail with the pack of coyotes hot on his hairy heels. Phew! See, they went chasing him down the gorge, huh? Run, coyote! Run, coyote! Run, jackrabbit! Run, jackrabbit! <clears throat> Dust swirled in the air as they chased jackrabbit up the ridge, down the ravine, and straight over Rattlesnake's rock. Hiss! Spit! Rattlesnake didn't like getting stomped on by jackrabbit's big kickers. Oh no, do si do yelped Jackrabbit, dancing this way or that and that away as he dodged Radal Snake's bats. Whew. He was moving so quickly trying to avoid getting bit by the rattlesnake. Oof. <clears throat> that pack of coyotes didn't give up. They chased Jackrabbit up the gulch and down the gully and into the middle of a herd of longhorn cattle. All Jackrabbit could think of to say was, One, two, three, tie ya yippee That drove the longhorns loco. They stampeded right around Jackrabbit and took off. Now, those coyotes were howling mad. They chased Jackrabbit through the prickly pear patch, around the area, and right down into the burrow of a spotted skunk. Woo-hoo, stinky-poo, cried Jackrabbit, holding his nose in disgust. Skunk didn't take kindly to the name-calling. Flicking her tail high, she took aim and... Pssst. But Jackrabbit was so scared and he was running so fast, he simply skedaddled past the stink-awful smell. That pack of coyotes didn't fare quite so well. That's the thing about little skunks, though. They stink. Woo, real bad to high heaven. That's their defense mechanism. That's how they keep from getting eaten or hurt. They give off a really bad smell. Ew, 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 pew! They howled in horror. He coyote, she coyote, and we coyote ran lickety split towards home as if a Texas tornado was on their tail. <laughs> There 
there's that skunk giving him the what's what. <laughs> now that big mouth jackrabbit was all tuckered out. He shuffled on back to the watering hole, his tongue hanging out like a rubber rope. <gasps> well, asked Roadrunner, what happened? wondered Gilla Monster. Don't you suppose you kissed any coyotes, did you? snickered Fox. Jack Rabbit sat up and grinned. Not only did I kiss those coyotes, I do -si doed with a rattlesnake. I scared off a herd of longhorns shouting, One, two, three, tie ya ya bee! and skedaddle past a skunk yelling woo woo stinky boo without getting all stunk up now what do you think of that <sighs> woo. before roadrunner gilla monster and fox could answer hawk came circling down from above how do do hawk cried jack rabbit sitting back on his hairy heels you may think you're a fine flyer but I'm far finer flyer than you I reckon I can leap off a ledge and glide above the desert without touching the ground all night long Ooh. them's flying words Hawk ruffled his feathers stuck his beak in Jack's rabbit's face and said Prove it. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Whew. It sounds to me, uh, <clears throat> it sounds to me that Jack Rabbit was a bit of an exaggerator. He sure knew how to tell a tall tale. Which means a story that's not completely true. Do you think that before he did all those things, he had really rallied up with a rattlesnake? He had really kissed coyotes? He had really said P.U. Stinky Poo to skunks? And that he had really rallied up longhorns like that? That's definitely up for you to decide. But the fact is, it ended up being true whether he could do it or not, right? <laughs> well, he might have been super lucky, but he sure did do it. Everything he said he could do. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at our schedule. Okay, so we read our book. Oop, wrong side. I'm going to get that little marker piece. And I'm going to move it down here to the animal missing game. And you know what else we're going to do with that, that, that box next to the word book? We're going to put a big old check in it to show that we did it. Check. Whoops. <laughs> We're going to take a little teeny tiny break. <clears throat> I'd like to encourage you to go run and get some water or go hug a random family member. Tell them that you love them or get some of your stuffed animals together. Whatever you want to do. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Okay, friends? See you soon.
Hey friends, welcome back. Thank you for your patience. Here we're gonna get started with the game. Whoops. You know what? I have a little bit of background music ready for you. I hope you enjoy as much as I did. What do we have in front of us here, friends? We have little doggies. Yep. These types of doggies are called chihuahuas. They are the world's smallest and some of the most loyal dogs out there. They were really, really important animals in the Aztec and Mexican locations a long time ago most valued valued pets they were known to keep the feet warm of very important people to this day they're very loyal and very loving to their owners so if you have a chihuahua at home you are a very lucky person this one's name is Milo can you say hi Milo <laughs> What colors are Milo? Brown and white. Let me introduce you to the rest of them. This here is Nibby. Ruff, ruff. <laughs> Can you say hi, Nibby? Hi, Nibby. This is Dawn. Can you say hi, Dawn? Hi, Don. And this is her brother, Dusk. Can you say hi, Dusk? Woof, woof. Hi, Dusk. And this here is their other brother, Shadow. Can you say hi, Shadow? Woof, woof. <laughs> now that we've met all of our puppies, we're going to play a game. Right here, I have a blank dog. Just their silhouette, doesn't have a name, doesn't have a face. I'm going to shut off the camera for just a few seconds. I'm going to take one of the puppies here. I'm going to either take Milo, Nibby, Dawn, Dusk, or Shadow. And you get to decide which one is missing. You're going to help us figure out the mystery. All right, are you ready? All right, you can close your eyes if you want. I'll let you know when to open them. You can open your eyes now. Which one of the puppies is missing? Look carefully. If you said Shadow, you're right. Shadow is missing. All right, good job. Let's play that again. Close your eyes. All right, open them. Which of our friends is missing? Look carefully. That's right. Nibby was missing. <laughs> Good job. All right, let's play one more time. This time I'm gonna mix up their positions. I'm gonna change where they are and see if you can guess. Ready? is missing. 
missing. Take your time. Is it Dusk, Dawn, Shadow, Milo, or Nibby? Who's missing? Great job. Dusk was missing. <laughs> and that's our game. I hope you enjoyed. Maybe this inspired you to make your own game with your family. We'll be right back and we'll finish up with our folktale. See you soon. squeaky chair, huh? <laughs> Alright. So. We did the second thing Iron Jen did today. We played the animal missing game. I'm going to put a big old check on it. And you know what? I just had a thought. Tomorrow I'm going to add something. <clears throat> Reflecting a bit on what we learned today. On Friday, when we learn about animals in the wild, we're going to sing a song. Have you ever heard of the song Little Bunny Foo Foo? If not, you're in for a treat. Alright, we will put on our list one of the things to do. After the book, we will sing the song. And then proceed with our game. So as you can see here, we have a check mark where it says the animal missing, which was the game we played. And now we're going to take the marker, place it right here, where it says folktale. We're going to finish that up. We're going to try to do this every time. So if you can help remind me, just give me a shout. Let me forget. Miss Mithril learns by doing. So sometimes it takes me a couple of tries to remember to new new things. Alright. <clears throat> Today's story is exactly the same title that's on this book. 
The Serpent Prince. Sometimes when you have a collection of stories in one book, they always tend to put a picture from one of the stories on the front cover in very nice detail. Alright, and now we're going to see why the Serpent Prince is featured on the front of this book. Ready? say it's about medium length of what we you what we usually do <clears throat> it's not super long all right <clears throat> get comfy here we go once upon a time a powerful Khmer prince lived in a fine city in what was now northeastern Finland thousands of people lived there and aside from the Emperor's own city this one was regarded as the finest in the realm everywhere the eye turned it could see beautiful stores palatal houses and awe-inspiring temples. The houses in the city were especially fine. The people took great pride in their homes and all of them were very well kept, except for one. In the whole city there was only one house that was small, ugly, and old, and it belonged to an old, crippled widow who could no longer work. For many years the people of the city had given her food and money, but as they continued to make their city more beautiful, they became more and more embarrassed by her house. To make matters worse, it was situated in the center of the town. Had it been on the edge of the town, they might not have been so annoyed, but it was right in the middle, and everyone who came to the city was sure to see it. It is scandalous, the people said, that she does not take better care of her home. One day, the prince decided he could not tolerate this eyesore any longer, and he sent a messenger to the widow. My prince has declared that you must move your house to another place, said the messenger. We plan to build a new temple on this land. The old woman replied, Tell our prince that I cannot move my house because I have no money to move it, and I have no more land to go to. When the prince heard this, he was exceedingly angry. He was so angry with the old woman that he did not think to offer her land and money so that she could move to her home. Instead, in his anger, the prince decreed, It is forbidden upon pain of death that anyone shall offer food, money, or help the old widow who lives in the center of our city. The prince and the people thought that she would soon die without their help. Then they could tear down the ugly old house and build their temple. In the meantime, the attention of the city and of the entire country was turned to the prince's daughter. She was considered the most beautiful girl in the land, and the people knew that her father was seeking a suitable young man to be her husband. The prince was besieged with young men wishing to marry the princess. Finally, out of desperation, he decreed, On the night of the next full moon I shall have a party to choose the princess's husband. At that time I will look carefully at anyone who is interested. Furthermore, because I want to make the proper choice for my daughter, every man who is not married is invited, and he may bring his family and friends with him. Now, beneath the city, deep under the ground, in an enormous cavern, was the kingdom of the serpents. The serpents knew about the city of the people above them. Its wonderful buildings amazed them, too. Nearly every day they sent one of the serpents up to the city. These serpents would transform themselves into people and walk about the city streets. Then they would return to the kingdom and tell the other serpents what they had seen. On the day the prince made his declaration, a serpent happened to be in the crowd, in disguise, of course. Immediately, he stole out of the city and re-entered his own secret kingdom in the ground. In the city above us, he told the other serpents. The prince has announced that he will choose a husband for his daughter at the party to be given next week. People above say that the prince's daughter is the most beautiful girl in the world and that this will be the most fabulous party ever given. When the son of the king of the serpents heard this, he thought, I will get permission from my father to be allowed to attend that party. I have not been to the city for years. But what he did not tell his father was that he intended to win the hand of the young princess. On the night 
of the prince's party, the whole city was astir. Not a soul, save one, remained at home. Even the married and the aged were present, for if they wanted to see whom the prince would choose. But one person was not present, the old widow. She could not come, for she knew she would not be welcome. And anyway, no one would help her get to the prince's palace. The young serpent was late in leaving his subterranean home. And by the time he emerged on the land disguised as a handsome young man, he could tell from the noise that the party had already begun. He was late. If he did not hurry, the prince might choose another man to, hurry the, to marry the princess before he arrived at the palace. What could he do? On a sudden impulse, he changed himself into a handsome white squirrel. He knew a squirrel could run much faster than a man could walk. He would be at the palace in no time whatsoever, and once he was there, the princess was very nervous. As she waited to join the party, she looked into the main rooms of the palace and saw throngs of people. It seemed as if there were more people at her party than she had ever seen in all of her life. She hoped her father would choose wisely. The princess paced up and down and stared out of the window and she was doing so as she noticed a large white squirrel hopping over the palace wall. It was so large that she wanted it. Guard! Shoot that squirrel, she said. I must have it. The guard fired it, and the squirrel fell to the ground, but before it died, its serpent spirit uttered a curse. Whoever eats my meat tonight shall die before the dawn's in sight, and every building in this town will by the dawn have fallen down. When the guard brought the dead squirrel to the princess, she marveled at its unusual size and its fine white fur. <sighs> it is indeed beautiful. Take it to the cook and tell him to roast it. It will be the finest dish at the supper tonight. By this time, the excitement in the palace was very great. Everyone was awaiting the entrance of the prince and his daughter. When at last they arrived, the people could hardly believe the beauty of the princess. She seemed to glow. But before the meal was to begin, the princess wished to speak. The room was quieted, and then she spoke. We have a very special dish for our supper tonight. Oh, would you like to see a picture of that white squirrel that the serpent had turned into? Here it is. Just like on the front of this book. That explains why we have a white squirrel whose tail turns into a whole bunch of serpents. And there's the princess. As I was preparing to enter the room, I looked out one of my windows. On the palace wall, I spied a beautiful white squirrel. The guard shot him, and his meat will be one of the dishes tonight. I am certain it is a good omen for us all. There will be enough for only one bite for each person, but I am confident it will be well worth it. Then the platter containing the squirrel was brought out. It was indeed no small squirrel, and everyone was anxious to please the princess by eating his share. And now a most miraculous thing happened. Each time a piece was taken... The meat was replenished, so there was never more or less than the first. Moreover, the meat was the most delicious food any of them had ever tasted, and none of the rest of the food was touched that night. Meanwhile, it had began to rain. With the first bite of the squirrel's meat, the rain was a gentle sprinkle, but soon it became a downpour, and yet no one inside the palace noticed the deluge outside. They were too busy eating the wonderful meat of the squirrel. Soon, water was pouring into the palace, and it happened so quickly that everyone drowned. Not a soul in the palace was able to save himself. And by dawn, the water had destroyed everything in the city. Palace, buildings, markets, homes, and even temples. Except for one house, everything was gone. Do you remember what house that was? Right. The old widow's house. Because she had not eaten of the squirrel's meat, the widow did not die. The king of the serpents, upon learning this, decreed that her home should not be destroyed with the rest of the city. The land around her house rose in the deluge and became an island in the middle of a huge lake. 
Many people still believe this story, and they can show you the lake. Within the island is the center to prove their belief. Ooh. And that's a legend of this island that exists today. Oh, this makes me very curious. I think I'm going to see what I can do about looking up pictures of that island. Maybe we can see what it looks like. How does that sound? Okay, I'll do some research and we'll make it an activity for next week. I will find some pictures of the Island of the Serpent Prince. Remember that this is just a legend. It's not expected to be real. But it sure does make a good story. Do you think things would have been different if the prince had been more kind to the old widow? What do you think would have happened if he would have been nicer to the old widow? That's an interesting idea. Absolutely. Alright. Well, that is our folk tale. Taking it off here. Where is my red marker? Did I put you over here? Oh, where did my red marker go? I can't check it off without the red marker. Oh no. What did Miss Smith will do with it, friends? Hmm. Well, I dropped it somewhere. Oh, you know what? No harm. Let's see. I'll just sit in the seat. <laughs> I'll just use this brown one. There we go. We have checked off the folktale. All right. We have done everything we shot for today. I hope you had fun as much as I did. And I look forward to seeing you on Friday, friends. On Friday, we're going to be reading the book, Bear Feels Scared. This one right here. Do you have this book at home? Either way, we can share my book. No worries. <laughs> oh, Maelstrom, hey. <laughs> I'll see you guys next time. Thank you for joining me today. Bye-bye.